All right, friends, this is going to be part 59 of Dinosaurs and Man. And we got a lot of ground to cover here, guys. We're going to go by as far as we can. We're going to still center our attention on Africa, especially right around that north, a little north of the equator, um, around the Congo swamp area. We may divert here and there in the areas, but in that generalized location is where we're going to be centering our attention on. But before we do that, I do want to clarify something that I said on my last video right at, towards the end of it when I was talking about J. Vernon McGee and how uh, Christians, you know, when they don't agree with each other, they kind of bash each other, beat each other up. It's almost like high school. You got the uh, different groups and different cliques and stuff. And um, it's just, it's ridiculous. <laughs> and so, but at any rate, I just want to clarify that J. Vernon McGee does believe in a literal six days of creation. He does. It's the age, the age of the earth, right around um, Genesis 1 and Genesis, uh, excuse me, Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2. Um, there's a lot of pastors out there. I won't say a lot of pastors, but there are a good number of people that I've met in the past that believe there's a gap of time between. Genesis 1 1 and Genesis 1 2. And um, they call it the gap theory. They call it the gap theory. And they say that could be an, um, just an indefinite amount of time in that area. And I think that's the same type of flavor that J. Vernon McGee was playing around with. Heck, Chuck Smith even played around with it. He didn't say for sure if he believed it, but he said it, you know, he was kind of on the fence with it. And so I think that's where J. Vernon McGee is. Um, but he does not hold. And he's very outspoken about it, that he does not believe that the earth and the universe and everything um, can be given a number of only 6,000 years, that it could be older than that. And so that's the only thing that I differ with him on. And so, uh, but other than that, he is a great expositor of the word of God. And so usually when I'm on the treadmill, um, I will listen to him. That's usually when I listen to him. But I go, I also study with him and... Uh, this is something that you can get from his ministry. It's called uh, the Bible Bus, and it's a little flash drive, and it's got every one of his Bible teachings on it. And so you can go, you can listen to them online. I mean, excuse me, on the radio or online, and you can go through the Bible. And I think five years is what they have. Great ministry, guys. They have an awesome ministry, and I highly advise that. And so little things here and there, I'm not going to break fellowship with somebody because they think the uh, universe and the earth itself is could, could be upwards of billions of years. If The main thing is, are they born again? Do they know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? And so I'm not going to break fellowship you know, with something, maybe a difference that we have on, on um, an interpreting of Scripture. And so I highly advise you guys to get up with his ministry. Awesome, awesome Bible expositor. Um, and But my my other person that I do study with, I've been studying with ever since I started studying the Bible, is Pastor Chuck Smith. And so, again, he's one of them that people bash, said that he was the one that introduced um, the contemporary church movement. And so you can go online to YouTube and see Pastor Chuck and his his actual church services, guys. And I want you to know, look at it. Is there anything wrong with that service? <laughs> I'm just going to let the man present this stuff himself. Awesome Bible expositor. And so um, I'm actually going through the Bible with Pastor Chuck Smith. I'm in Second Chronicles right now. And, um, and I'm actually going through the Bible with J. Vernon McGee whenever I'm on the treadmill or I'm taking a ride somewhere. Um, that could be um, extensive, um, I listen to him. And so, and I'm in the book of John um, with J. Vernon McGee. And so I supplement, and I've learned stuff, good things um, from both of these men. And so, uh, but at any rate, guys, let's get moving here. If you'll notice on the screen, this is a uh, uh, an article from the New York Herald. And they ask, is a brontosaurus Roman Africans, Africa's wilds? And this is from February 13th, 1910. 1910. And um, this one here, there could be dinosaurs by Ivan T. Sanderson. And this is the Saturday Evening Post, January 3rd, 1948. And I do have this magazine. Matter of fact, it is right here. Um... This is it. Um, I was actually able to uh, get a copy of it, and I don't have it. Let me get it. I don't have it um, out of the sleeve 
Um, but this thing is old, guys. This thing is really old. Um, the cost on it is 15 cents. Can you see that? <laughs> 15 cents. But it has this article. It has this article inside of this magazine. And so, and I've got some other magazines that's, that's really wild um, that I'm going to show you. But when I first started putting my stuff together, whenever I do classes and stuff, sometimes I'll bring this stuff for show and tell just to say that, hey, listen, yeah, this was an actual article. And, uh, and so if I can get as much stuff on his hand and show, folks just like to see that. And so, but this was, this looks like this was in a library. And uh, because on the inside of it, you can see where people had checked it out. And it has the dates on it. Um, I'm talking, you know, 1948. You can see the, the stamps where people have, uh, have checked this out. But at any rate, in this, uh, we're going to go through some things in this article here. But um, it says here from this article, and I'm going to quote this. It says, a well-known South African big game hunter uh, Mr. F. Gobbler returned from a trip to Angola and announced to the Cape Town newspaper, the Cape Argus, that there was an animal of large dimensions, the description of which could only fit a dinosaur, dwelling in the Dololo swamps and known to the natives as uh, the Chippequi. It has the head and tail of a lizard. The, now, if you'll notice below that picture there, now that picture there, that is exact, that is actually um, what the article, the first part of it looks like. It's a very extensive article, but it says below that, the Azande people in Central African Republic call it Naguri, Naguri. Um, now, this is some extra notes that I got down here. In the Congo Basin, there are over 230 varieties of languages um, that are spoken. In Cameroon, there are over there are 50, 52 to fifty three languages. Fifty three languages. Now, this wasn't from this article. This was was from an, another source. But that just shows you guys that sometimes whenever you get different, um, you get different names for the different animals. That it doesn't mean they're contradicting each other. It's because they are, have different languages, and that really should show more evidence that this animal really does exist. Because they're talking about, they may have a different name for it, but they're talking about the same type of animal when they start going into the description of the animal. Now, before I give you the quote from this gentleman right here, I need you to give you a background exactly who he is. His name is Carl Hagenbach. Hagenbach. Um, and uh, a German fellow, so I hope I'm pronouncing the name right. But he was born June 10th. 1844, and he died April 14th, 1913. He was the pioneer, guys. Listen to this, guys. He was the pioneer of the open-air zoos. Now, what open-air means is that there's no bars or anything. It resembles the, the enclosures that the animals have is more of, of what the animals would be like in their natural habitats. Sometimes they have water like moats around it. It's barless. It's open-air enclosures. So most of your modern zoos is going to look like this right here. And so every a lot of my folks that are in the North Carolina area, I think it's the uh, Richmond, Richmond County, um, the zoo there, they have, um, that's the way this zoo is. A lot of the enclosures out there are the animals can kind of run free and stuff. And so, but um, he began his career as an animal dealer taking orders from zoos and circuses. And we're going to come back to that word circus here in just a minute. Um, then he hired hunters, which he would accompany to jungle regions and snow-clad mountains. Now, this is a little something to put on your plate, a little extra um, that I thought you would find interesting. Did you know that the that circuses, where the, the origin of the word came from, the great Roman amphitheater was called circuses after the Latin word for circle, where um, they were most often devoted to gladiatorial combats, chariot races, and the slaughter of animals, mock battles, and other blood sports. The most spectacular of these arenas, the Circus Maximus, was in operation for more than 1,000 years. It would seem on the surface that these exhibitions of carnage had little in common with modern circuses, yet, it is from the early Roman circuses that traditions such as trained animals and the pre-show parade um, derive. Um, he trained animals by bef befriending them, 
to emphasize the animal's intelligence over ferocity. I can, I can really uh, respect a guy like that. It goes on to say, when the animal trade declined in the 1870s, he began to produce and travel with um, ethnographical shows. These featured people and animals from around from remote regions. Carl Hagenbeck died from a snake bite, which was believed to have been from a bloom sl- a, b- a bloom slang. A bloom slang. Now that picture right there on the bottom right hand corner of the the screen there, that is what that snake looks like. Um, it's a venomous snake, which the venom and the venom causes hemorrhages and can be fatal to humans in small amounts. Now, the Hagenbach Zoo in Hamburg, Germany is still open and has more than 1,400 animals from all continents. Now, this is a quote that um, Hagenbach said. This is from that article, There Could Be Dinosaurs. This is what he said about that area and as far as dinosaurs. He said, I received reports from two quite distinct sources of the existence of an immense and wholly unknown animal said to inhabit the interior of Rhodesia. Almost identical stories reached me, firstly, through one of my own travelers, and secondly, through an English gentleman who had been shooting big game in Central Africa. The reports were thus quite independent of each other. The natives, it seemed, had told both my informants that in the depths of the great swamps, there dwelt a huge monster, half elf, elephant, half dragon. This, however, is not the only evidence for the existence of the animal. It is now several decades ago since Minguez, who is, of course, perfectly reliable, heard a precisely similar story from the Negroes and still more remarkable on the walls of of certain caverns in Central Africa, there are to be found actual drawings of this strange creature. From what I have heard of the animal, it seems to me that it can only be some kind of dinosaur. Seemingly, Aiken, um, akin, um, that means uh, similar in character, to the brontosaurus. Now, we've talked about that brontosaurus in several previous videos. The brontosaurus is actually the apatosaurus. Um, and so, Again, right down there, the um, if you'll notice that picture right there, long neck, um, big body, and a tail. And so, uh, but at any rate, that's Carl Hagenbach. Hagenbach. And so now, this right here is another um, article. I don't know the exact date on it, um, but at any rate, we're going to go through some of this article here. Um, this right here is Herman and Kia Regusters, and this is... Uh, uh, an eyewitness account that they had. It says the creature was just poking its head out of the water and diving back in. The photo was not developed um, in the Congo, of course, but will be developed very carefully at Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, where Herman worked. Nobody knows now what's on the photograph. The creature was dark brownish in color. The skin appeared slick and smooth with a long neck and small head. Herman saw it, Kia saw it, and they saw it, and they saw it on several occasions, and they heard it making this tremendous roar. He said many other members of the expedition, and this includes government officials from the Republic of Congo, saw it and heard it. Now, from what I understand, this is that photograph. If you'll notice there on the fo- foreground, you can kind of see, you got to look at it real closely, but you'll see on the back part of it, you got the, the back, the back part of it, but the front, you can see a neck. You can see what appears to be a neck and it looked like it's going, either it's coming out or going back in the water. Now, from what the, uh, uh, the eyewitness testimony says is that it was going back into the water. And so they snapped the shot real quick before it went back in. And so I got to honestly admit, I will say, if this is legit, this picture is legit, I think it's kind of amazing that they even got this because you're so caught up in the moment of what you're looking and what you're seeing. And so, but uh, for what it's worth, guys, this could be, very well could be that picture, which I believe it is. Now, this is Marcelin Agnagna, and uh, he drew what he saw in the swamp in 1983. And what I did is I got a video recording of his testimony, him actually talking, and I dictated from that. And so this is what he said, and I dictated from what 
His words are, he said, the animal was in the water. I just saw the back, the neck, and the head of the animal out of the water. And I know that in the forest in that region, there is no mammals living in the water. There are some reptiles like crocodiles and some other lizards. But the animal was also so big and great. The neck was like, when I saw it, it was like one meter out of the water. And the back was like three meters of large and it was really exceptional. The back of the animal was black and it was shining because the day was really sunny and the back was was shining and it was a black black back and the neck was two and the, and the neck too was black and shining but the face the frontal part of of the face was brown. It was really clear, something clear and I could I could see the eyes, the eyes of the animal um, the head. Now I'm gonna stop right there just for a minute. It appears from now. I, now he's got a really strong accent, so his English is a little bit broken. So I tried to dictate exactly how he talked and what he said. Um, but he says that something on the face had a clear look to it. It was kind of a a clear. Uh, the it looked visually clear on the face. He couldn't make it out real good. Now he goes on to say. The head was red like a lizard head, and the animal was trying to look at us and was looking for us because I think we disturbed the animal and start moving around and looking for us. We stayed like 20 minutes looking at the animal until it went down into the water and progressively went down into the water. And so that right there is his, um, his uh, testimony on what he saw. And again, this right here is from the uh, Herald Focus Exploration. Um, this is Tuesday, June 29th, 1999 from the Boston Herald, and where an expedition was said to go and look for, um, again, the dinosaurs in that area of the Congo, and they called it a half god, half beast. And so, uh, but at any rate, Guys, we're going to stop right there. This was kind of a lengthy one, and uh, but again, very good. There's a lot of good information here, and so I'm trying to keep these things in uh, it, topical um, blocks as much as I can. So um, some areas are a little bit easier to to uh, chop up than others. But um, again, I hope you guys enjoyed. I hope you've learned something, and uh, I love you. And I hope you guys have a great day, and the Lord blesses you real good. Bye bye.